Aloha, mi amigos y mi amigas out there in Corona Land. This is Mr. Smith coming to you from the white sandy beaches of lovely Kearney, Missouri. I'm going to drop a little knowledge on you about Amendments Number 4 and Amendments Number 5 of the United States Constitution, which you will find in the Bill of Rights. So pull up your notes, sit in your hammock, pour yourself a nice tropical drink, and follow along as we talk about Amendments 4 and 5 to the United States Constitution. So, uh, Amendment number four, if we're going through our notes. Amendment four states that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Now, this right has been tested over the years in multiple Supreme Court cases. What it requires is that authorities must have a warrant, which has to be signed and authorized by a judge in, in order to search your property. And this can include your house, your vehicle, a backpack, for instance, or even your own person, uh, such as items that you may be carrying in your pockets. So the police can search any of that property if they have a warrant. Now, if they don't have a warrant, police can also use probable cause in order to search any of those items. So if the police happen to be going through your neighborhood and they hear a gunshot, that's some pretty serious probable cause. So the police would have the right to go and search that property because there could be reasonable suspicion a probable cause that a crime is taking place. This has also been tested with people's, on people's person. So for instance, are you walking down the street and you, uh, it's late at night, say 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and there's been reports of break-ins in automobiles and somebody calls in a report and you fit the description, can police stop you and search you? Absolutely they can. They would be within their rights under having probable cause. There are many, many instances, however, where the police uh, cannot search your property if they don't have probable cause. And that probable cause can be tested in a court of law. Moving on to our next slide, Fourth Amendment does not extend to private companies. Fourth Amendment only guards your uh, right to privacy uh, from the government. It does not extend to private properties. So if uh, you are uh, at work uh, can your boss ask to search through your locker, for instance? Well, that's not your locker. That's the business's locker. Same with school as well. Your locker? Not your locker. It's the school's locker. And they can search through your property if necessary. One of the examples that they have up here, uh, or that I have up here, not they, I, uh, is uh, under the link, you click on it, as I'm doing right now, have what's called the American Bar Association. Any questions you may have regarding the Constitution, they are an excellent source to find your answers. So, as you scroll down through there, does the Fourth Amendment prevent pr businesses and neighbors from invading an individual's privacy? No. Only uh, privacy laws enacted by Congress and state legislatures only apply uh, to the government and not so much with uh, private employers. So yes, your employer can look through your property, it can look through your emails, if you're, if you're on company time and you're using a company email, you are, you're, those things are absolutely not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I would encourage you to look through uh, some of the examples that you would find on that list there about frequently asked questions about the Fourth Amendment, you find your, your answers there. Uh, two key cases about the Fourth Amendment. You have New Jersey versus TLO. Uh, this involved an official search of a student's purse without probable cause. Can a, a school official search through a student's purse without probable cause? Yes. Yes, we can. Will that happen? Not likely. There has to. If you're going to find uh, yourself being searched at school, uh, there's probably going to be a, a reason for that search. Uh, another one that would apply to students would be Vernonia School District versus Acton. Can schools randomly test uh, students involved in athletics or, academic, or, uh, or activities? Uh, yes, as you know, we do have a drug testing policy at our school, and that particular policy emanated from this case, Vernonia School District versus Acton. Moving on, let me be looking at, let me scroll over real quick our right to privacy. Do you have a right to privacy? Well, in the Constitution, there is no specific guaranteed right to privacy. You can read the Constitution, and I know you like to, but when you look through it, you will see that there is no specific uh, explicit 
right to privacy that's guaranteed in the Constitution. Now, over the years, through its interpretation, particularly uh, through judicial activists, they have read the right of privacy does exist, even though it doesn't explicitly state it, that you do have the right to privacy. One particular case that this would apply to would be Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, where the court ruled that various amendments can be interpreted that you do have an expectation of privacy. So, for instance, in your own home, you do have some expectations of privacy uh, to where the government should not be involved and interfere with that. Uh, the Constitution does not explicitly define privacy, and so it's ultimately up to the courts to determine what privacy is and does that right extend to a particular circumstance. Moving on to our next one, the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment provides protections for people who are accused of crimes. The provisions for the Fifth Amendment include nobody has to stand trial for a federal crime unless they have been indicted, which means they have been formally accused of that crime. Secondly, there is a grand jury. A grand jury is a special panel who listen to evidence against a person to determine if there even should be a trial. Now, this isn't a, a specifically a jury. You are not on trial yet. What a grand jury does is they sit down, they look at the evidence, and they uh, go to prosecutors and they state, uh, should there be a case brought against this person, or is there a lack of evidence, and should the case be uh, dismissed? Uh, for lack of evidence. And so a grand jury, jury is kind of a trial before a trial, if you would. And then also you'd find under the Fifth Amendment provisions regarding double jeopardy, in which you can't be tried for the same crime twice, unless, unless the jury cannot agree on a verdict. In this case, there is a mistrial declared, and then you will be given a new trial. But that's only when a jury can't agree uh, ultimately on a verdict. If you are found not guilty or if you are acquitted, that crime cannot be charged against you again. That would uh, constitute uh, double jeopardy. Or you can request a new trial. If you request a new trial based upon uh, maybe there's some sort of bias you'd find within the jury or maybe you need a, a different attorney or if there's some sort of conflict with the prosecutor or judge, you can request a new trial or change of venue and that would not constitute a double jeopardy violation because you are requesting a whole new trial altogether as the defendant. Due process is found within the Fifth Amendment in which the government must follow established legal procedures. There are two types of due process. Procedural due process it consists of government must follow certain procedures when punishing a person. You're not going to see somebody uh, executed for littering. You're not going to see an excessive fine of, say, $50,000 for uh, you know, petty theft. And then secondly, the other type of due process is substantive due process. Are the laws themselves fair and just? Perhaps the law, the way it was written, was written in an unfair manner at the time. For instance, during the Civil Rights era, you would find where uh, people who are African Americans would be punished differently according to the law because of uh, Jim Crow laws and the way they're written, where they would treat African Americans one way and whites a different way. Your rights cannot be deprived by legally passed laws. Again, going back to the racial segregation, uh, your rights cannot be taken from you by someone writing a law. Also, you'll find under the Fifth Amendment, you cannot be forced to testify against yourself. That means you uh, protection against self-incrimination. So if the police, if the prosecution, if even the judge is asking you questions and you feel like uh, your answers could put you in some sort of legal trouble where you could be uh, punished in some fashion, do not answer those questions. You immediately respond with, I plead the fifth. You've probably seen this in movies, you've probably seen this in TV shows, I plead the fifth. It means that you don't have to answer those responses or answer those questions because your response could land you in some sort of uh, legal trouble. So you can always plead the Fifth Amendment uh, whenever it comes to any question you might not be comfortable with. Those are your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights as they are under the Constitution. There is so much more information regarding both the Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, but we don't need to go uh, too far down the rabbit hole to discuss those things. Uh, I hope you guys are having a, a safe uh, you know, break away from school. I hope you're taking care of things. Uh, please look to Google Classroom for any further information or assignments. I know I'm going to be posting today uh, a question on GoFormative. Please take a look at that. Uh, with respect to the worksheet that was assigned on Tuesday, I do need to have that by Friday if you've not already answered that. Uh, 
if you have any questions, feel free to email me or shoot me a remind message. And remember, aloha also means goodbye.